How's it going, everybody? My name is Antonio, and you're watching Resource Heads, the only news regurgitating show on the internet that makes news more easily digestible than a keel smoothie at a Texas barbecue. As you would know, I'm the only host on the internet that has um, both has orange hair and it has the sense of humor of a grumpy cat attending a dog parade. So if that rubs you the wrong way, please save yourself the time. Don't waste your time and just move on. There's better videos out there to watch. This, though, is episode um, 79 of Resource Heads, and it covers the 33rd week of the year, which happened between August 14 and August 18. Now, if you've watched more than one of these uh, first of all, congratulations. You might just have become my new therapist, and you're uh, probably also more interested in me than my own wife. Don't worry, though. I'm not I'm not going to charge you in, in deeply insightful punchlines, jokes, or any directional market commentary. That's not what I'm here for today. But I will make you listen to my rants about um, well, China at the beginning, but that's going to lead into gold, copper, oil. And then eventually I'm going to talk um, about uranium. There's quite 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 a few, quite, quite the interesting things happening in uranium. And obviously, I, I also have Luke Denhava from GoldDiscovery.com um, for, for an interview because he, he he predicted in 2016, he predicted the end of the uh, of the bear market in, uh, in, in gold and in gold stocks almost to the day. So I have him on this week to, well, I, I don't know, just to see if he still feels as, as lucky now. And of course, to talk to me about what's happening in the junior market. Besides the regularly scheduled human horrors, beside beyond my um, soulless comprehension. So, um, yeah, I uh, I want to start with an overview of of just generally global markets and how they, these they are influencing commodities. Um, I'm just going to go through a couple of headlines that show or or suggest maybe better suited here that suggests where we might be in terms of commodity demand. I'll try not to share my personal opinion too much, but really only go through the headlines and through some of the data that I'm seeing. And um, I guess what better place to start with than China, which is, again, going to be the focus on on today's um, rant. And I'll start here with some hard data first, and then I'll move on to some other headlines out there that explain what that this hard data means for various sectors uh, like gold, copper, um, oil, and so on and so forth. So Monday was a news-heavy day for China with uh, it's actually really a, a, a week worth of news in a day with uh, industrial production, retail sales, and fixed asset investments being announced, as well as um, unemployment rate. Now, simply put, they all missed on expectations. They all came below last time's numbers, suggesting uh, a contraction in the Chinese economy. Retail sales for July, they were expected to come in with a 4.5% growth, but they came in with a 2.5% growth. And they uh, and that was also well below last time's 3.1% uh, number. Industrial production came for the for the same period for, for July. It also came in below expectations, which those expectations were set at 4.4%, but uh, they were met with only a 3.7% growth. Fixed asset investments only grew by 3.4%, where a 3.8% growth was expected, which would have been in line with last time's numbers, but this time they came in below last time's numbers. And then the Chinese unemployment rate was actually, uh, this was actually pretty much the only thing that didn't miss on expectations. It did come in at 5.3% uh, as expected, but it also came in higher than last time's 5.2%. This is not necessarily out of the ordinary for China. It's also not a big jump either or anything like that, So, but it is there. The, uh, the, 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 then later on in the week, the uh, Chinese FDI, which is short for Foreign Direct Investments, also came in below expectations because where a growth of 2% was expected, we saw a decline, a uh, big decline too, of 4%. But that isn't something to go too crazy about either because China regularly goes through these pockets of negative growth in their FDI. And they're also investing, as I reported last week, plenty of money in the natural resource space abroad. So there's that. Now, in response to all that, what's hap what happened this week was very important. And that was that China's central bank cut its interest rates. So they... Um, well, they didn't pivot, actually, because it, it might have been unexpected to some of those, specifically because this is the second time China has done this in three months. They cut their, their interest rates earlier this year as well. Now, that's not normally how the central banks in China, uh, how, how the central bank in China has operated over recent past. They've, um, they, they're normally not as aggressive in their rate cuts. It, they're known to sort of uh, employ a wait and see type of strategy to... Uh, well, for a while at least, um, after making a move. But again, this is the second time 
in three months. So it is notable. Next week is also important for, for Chinese interest rates because the PBOC will be publishing its LPR, which is short for loan prime rate. So if they cut that, they're basically saying, you know, we want more loans. We want the banking sector to put more money into the economy. And that would make total sense to me considering what I reported on last week, which was uh, that China was heavily missing out on 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 new loans. It was not adding as much uh, money in loans as they were hoping for. And therefore, um, you know, I, I suppose that was going to slow down their economy. And I still believe that, I guess this is. This is mostly seen across um, markets, by the way, what's happening here with the race cu rate cuts, excuse me, it, it's seen across markets as uh, too little, too late, though. And if you don't believe the market, uh, well, then you might want to believe Evergrande, which is Evergrande, by the way, is the second largest property developer in China. And uh, they have filed for U.S. bankruptcy protection under Chapter 15. Um once again, showing us that this happened this week, obviously, once again, showing us that China's debt crisis in the real estate market um, that builds empty skyscrapers is uh, is probably not really sustainable over the long run. And this comes on top of multiple reports, though not always trustworthy, but multiple reports coming out of different corners of the world, uh, China itself to showing declining prices of the Chinese real estate market. So Evergrande, by the way, is still in negotiations with, with, with its creditors, so they might be able to get out of this one without crashing everything around them. But smaller real estate developers in China have already proven that it wouldn't be out of the ordinary for a complete bankruptcy to occur in uh, in those you know debt-ridden companies, really. So, which, by the way, this basically leaves you know buildings half finished, half unfinished, if you will. Uh, it leaves workers and suppliers unpaid and... It also leaves just, I guess it leaves a, a big hole in, in, in the heart of, of China bulls generally. So as well as just regular Chinese folks who generally really love real estate as an asset class. I guess it's it's a very cultural thing. But yeah, anyway, so this debt restructuring that Evergrande is going through is actually pretty important for the whole world. I think it's not only China uh, because China is the biggest, if not if, if, if not the biggest, at least a very, very significant trading partner for most of the world. And more importantly, perhaps, they're the U.S.'s biggest trading partner. So obviously, I'd hope they can resolve this. I don't want to see it crash and burn. But again, I, I wouldn't be shook if, if they didn't because, well, basically because of what I just told you at the beginning of this, as well as, as last week's episode um, about the about the economic data that's coming out of China. Now, cutting the rates was not the only thing that China did. Apparently, they were injecting um, quite a lot of money um, in, in the system. They injected specifically 204 billion yuan through seven-day reverse repos, while also cutting borrowing costs by 10 basis points on those to uh, now 1.8%, which is also made clear this week, by the way. But that, that's generally seen by the market, again, as too little, too late. And that may sound weird because the push for stimulus in China is not small. This is, you know, cutting the interest rates was not the only thing they did. They've tried doing a lot. Uh, but th th those are not small efforts, right? But they are, as many again s said or are seeing, they appear to be too little too late. With the too, le too, too late part being the, um, the thing that's really causing the trouble here, they should have really done that earlier. Or at least that's the commentary that I'm seeing out there. But okay, this is resource talks. So let's do talk about the Chinese economic data and how that ties into the resources market before all four of you still watching realize that discussing the news is kind of like trying to teach an environmentalist basic physics or teach me how to do division in my head. You know, it's entertaining. It's occasionally baffling. can have a couple of laughs, but it's ultimately a waste of time. Gold. Gold's a resource, right? Somehow a controversial resource these days, despite it literally doing nothing, almost nothing, besides it being a pet rock for... Um, libertarians, but okay, I'm not afraid of, I'm not afraid of that. Well, I'll talk about gold. I don't mind. I'll share the news that um, I'm seeing, and I'll, I'll, I hope to get some pushback in the comments on, on why these news, this news doesn't matter. Uh, but the Chinese don't only love real estate as an asset class. They also really, really, really love gold. And um, it looks like falling retail sales might be an issue for gold, because while China is making an effort to increase its uh, central bank reserves denominated in gold, which basically means that their central bank is and has been buying a lot of gold. They've increased their buying of gold. And as I've reported, and by the way, it's probably probably a whole lot more than what I um, than what you and I can see. But the point is, most gold demand comes from China and India, number one. Matter of fact, when it comes down to jewelry, China demands about four times as much gold for jewelry as the third one in the list, which is the US. And why that matters is because most gold demand in the world 
about 50% of the world demand for gold is jewelry jewelry related. That's kind of hard to say. And only about 23% comes from central bank buying and then about the same comes from bullion investors. And uh, well, those are glo global numbers, by the way, not only China. That number for, for jewelry demand, when we zoom in on China, that number goes up in the 60s, well above 60, actually. So um, it goes from about 47 on a world scale to well over 60 of China's demand for um, for gold um, that is in the jewelry sector. So conclusion, Chinese really like gold jewelry. It's, again, a cultural thing. So with the Chinese economy not looking as healthy, to put it mildly, I guess, the retail sales falling um add to that the fact that the yuan has been really lagging against other currencies and also against gold on a on a sustained sustained basis if you look at the gold price um denominated in in the yuan you would see that for quite a while um gold's been going up basically in the yuan which means that the yuan is going down against gold well that's making gold jewelry more and more expensive for the chinese and uh, i'm not too bullish on the chinese jewelry market right now matter of fact not only is the yuan falling against the dollar and making gold jewelry therefore more expensive. Chinese gold jewelry is just generally more expensive than Western jewelry for for you know same weight type and all that. And now uh, that premium for Chinese jewelry is now only growing. Bloomberg reported this week that the Shanghai spot price of gold was more than forty dollars an ounce higher than that in London. Apparently, that's due to um, some sort of tighter supply within China because of specifically because of. Um, import shenanigans of some sorts that are unclear as of now, but it's resulting in, it's basically the government in some shape or form putting a little bit of red tape breaks on uh, importing gold by the private sector. So what's that resulted in is non-bullion demand falling by about 35% in June. Okay, so the demand is falling there. And I, I'm not even opening the can of worms that is the uh, what if question is in. What if, what if China and India see some very bad economic times and and people who generally hold a lot of gold i believe it's i believe in china don't quote me on this but i believe it's at around 30 grams per capita um oh that was for india no that was for india because india is, is supposed to be number one so it's about 30 grams per capita for india and some 20 grams or so per capita for china which is a lot of gold generally for westerners i don't know if you have 30 grams of gold but most people don't and um i, I don't even want to talk about what ha what would happen if those people were forced um, economically to tap into those savings, which oftentimes is seen as, as the family wealth, sort of family savings in these cultures. And so they drop their gold on the market that that on, on a market that has or that already has lower demand for non-bullion gold. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm not even going to open that can of worms, but maybe you should think about that. And, you know, add to that the not so great retail data from the other two large consumers of gold next to China, that being uh, India and the U.S., as I said, who combined, by the way, if you'd remove China from that list and you combine um, the U.S. and India, they consume about one and a half times as much gold as the rest of the countries that make up the top 10 of gold consumers in the world. It's a lot of gold, right? And it's primarily India, of course, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, it, well, India and China, which is to say that when India and China and in the U.S. as well are, are seeing not as strong retail sales, which, by the way, in the U.S. this week, the not so strong retail sales were blamed on the weather. Um, so I, I've tried doing that with my wife a few times. It doesn't work that well. But if that happens when they're seeing this, this could influence global demand for gold, which is is already, is, is, as I already said, it's not strong. And it seems like the gold market might be going into an oversupply in 2023 and 2024. Now, there is a possibility that, you know, with the Chinese central bank now cutting rates while other central banks have um, have said that they won't be doing any of that anytime soon, specifically the, the ECB and the Fed is also saying that it's going to be data driven and therefore not necessarily going to be cutting interest rates. Which will be hurting the vo the value of um of the Chinese currency as it has. By the way, the yuan is down eight percent versus the dollar this year alone. And so, if that happens, and in addition, their economy is uh, not in great shape, it it could be that people will look for refuge in gold. Sure, it could be, and that would increase the bullion demand for gold. But the demand for bullion gold, the demand for investment grade gold, basically, is at around twenty percent of China's total demand. As I told you. Jewelry demand above 60. On top of that, how much can demand really increase if China has 0% interest rates? Um, or even as reported last week, 0% um, uh, inflation rate, excuse me, they don't have 0% interest rates, maybe soon, but they do, do, as reported last week, they actually have negative inflation right now. They have a pocket of deflation as we're speaking right now, at least over the short run. 
And they also have positive uh, real rates because of that. What happens to gold demand? How much can gold demand really grow in that environment? Uh, bullion demand, which again is only 20% of China's total demand. And then although this is basically just me saying, hey, you know, what, what if this data is right? So big assumptions, we don't necessarily know, but big, big assumptions are being made here in, in this rent. But even if this is mostly wrong, the price of gold should be telling me that all this data is wrong, right? What if this data, what if all this data was wrong? Sure, we can think about that scenario. What if, but something should be telling me that the data is wrong. At least the price of gold should be telling me that. But the price of gold fell again this week. It fell confidently below $1,900 an ounce to um, to now $1,888, which is, this is a five month low for gold. And it's also apparently the longest consecutive lo losing streak in six years. So the price of gold is definitely not telling me that this data is wrong. Of course, you can end pretty much any argument by saying, oh, it's the banksters who were manipulating gold lower and um, and so on and so forth. But I, I find very little to no actionable value in that argument. So I'll, I'll leave that to the comment section to make that argument. It's always fun, which it inevitably does. There's always inevitably that comment down below. So do that in the comments. I want to talk about um, in the comments. I'm happy to talk about it, laugh a little bit about it. But anyways... Again, please understand that this is just a short term that I'm looking at over here, okay? Over the long run, I believe the system is built and sustained pretty much only on cycles of money printing. And I believe over time that results in structural inflation. And we are underinvesting in mining and exploration and M&A slowing down if you exclude uh, this year's Newmont deal. And it's getting harder to find decent gold deposits. And it is with other metals as well and so on and so forth. So I remain positive about the price of gold over decades. But what I'm reading here suggests something else over the short run. And the price of gold seems to be sniffing that out as well by, well, you know, falling. So sentiment in the gold market has also been uh, falling it, with the BPGDM index, which is a sentiment index, a breath index, really. But it's, um, well, I call it a sentiment index, as most people do. And this is showing a reading of about 21, which is generally considered very low for this index. So it is not the lowest that the index has gotten to uh, last year in the fall. It... Um, wait for it, it fell below 10. Good joke, right? So be greedy when others are fearful and vice versa. Sure does look nice in a t-shirt. And if you're a billionaire, it looks nice coming out of your mouth, but they really never tell you what level of fear you should see and you should match with what level of greed. So anyways, the, the, the index on here, the RSI on this index has dipped below 30. It is now at around 28, suggesting that the index is oversold. And uh, also the 200-day moving average is trying to go for a death cross by crossing the 50-day uh, moving average. That would be the blue line on this chart here onto the downside. And that's typically not a not a sign of turning, turning around sentiment, um, which is, well, the sentiment is further supporting the data that I've uh, ranted on, um, uh, the, that I've ranted on about so far in this episode. Um, so the, the data is not telling me that gold should be going up. The price of gold is not telling me that it's going to be going up, and the sentiment is not telling me that it's going that it's going to be going up. And maybe you could try making the argument that rising prices will, um, re, you know, rising rising costs for mining they will make miners unprofitable, but they aren't. At least not most of them. Some miners are losing money. The bad companies are they're obviously losing money when they're mismanaging their companies. But even still, if they were, um, I believe the the average uh, all in sustaining cost would be at around thirteen hundred dollars right now. But even if they were, if they were losing money, most of the gold that ends up on the market and that is being bought, uh, for example, by China, that's not coming from underground. It's actually coming from above ground inventories because most of the gold that we ever mined is still around. So if gold miners stop making money, that's my point, that wouldn't be a reason for gold to go up the same way that it is, for example, if tin miners stop making money or uranium miners stop making money. Okay, So I see no immediate reason for gold to go up. I guess not me. This data over here is telling me that there's no immediate reason for gold to go up. And, you know, Rick Kroll always tells me that commodities go up when two conditions are met. Commodities need to be able to go up. So the uh, commodities go up, he says, when they can go up and when they must go up. Both of these conditions need to be met. Well, with gold over the short run, there is no must, right? Sure, it could, but there's no must based on all this information that could be very very well could be wrong and i'm looking forward to being corrected uh in the comments below now gold's not the only thing being influenced by all of this of course most commodities are china is a huge consumer of commodities it's the largest consumer of commodities in the world 
so naturally to the biggest markets out there without being oil and coal uh, or oil, excuse me, oil and copper are also being influenced by China. And it, it, by the way, if this wasn't clear, this was my poor attempt at segueing into oil. Um, and before I start, I have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes down to oil, even less than I normally do. Um, and, and, and why I'm saying this, by the way, I'm saying that that oil is also being influenced is because it's not only the Chinese economic data suggesting that things are not as clean as we might have expected them to be over in China. Chinese oil demand is also doing some weird stuff, some notable stuff to me. Take, for example, this headline. China oil buying frenzy cools as record inventory shields it from price rally, unquote. So apparently China, which again, as you would know, is the largest consumer of oil in the world, has learned that buying low is a good idea. As uh, what they did is that they built their own storage capacities, basically. And so we over here in the West obviously made fun of them for doing that because we thought it was silly. But when OPEC said that they would cut production earlier this year, Chinese imports of oil increased and they had place to store it, which was a, a nice given. And what they're doing right now, as the price of oil has risen to 80 and beyond it, and it's actually st stayed there, it's even this week, uh, tried falling below it, it fell below it for a brief while midweek, and then it re regained the, um, the, the $80 support towards the end of the week. But so China is not importing much oil above 80 right now, as they've, uh, they've created their own cheaper supply. It's only not coming out of the ground, it's coming out of their own reserves. Now, if they were growing, as we might have expected them to be growing, they would have been importing oil right now, even more oil, and they would just be keeping their reserves full. But um, I guess the word that I'm looking for here is lackluster demand. I don't like that word lackluster because it's really used in it's used in the media a lot. And I don't know, I, I don't have a good feeling, but lackluster demand. So it's not... It's not like there is no demand for oil, but it's just lackluster demand, as the media would write it. Well, that's pushed oil from its intermediate term high of around 90, not quite, but almost 90, to now, yeah, about 80 a barrel right now. So but basically what happened is that China sold low prices. They uh, listened to OPEC announcing production cuts. They saw the war was not getting resolved anytime soon, and they were preparing to reopen their, their economy with, um, with a boom. So they stacked oil to historically high levels. But the economy never never recovered as quickly as expected. So the demand for oil is just not as expected. It's not as high as expected, leading to increasing the reserves instead of drawing down on them. And so the reserves are now sitting at, at all-time highs uh, at around the billion barrels mark. That's historically high, quite a lot of oil too. But they now do have a lot of cheap oil, and they will not need to buy at around 80 or $85 a barrel to fill up their reserves because um, well, because they're pretty much full. Okay, it makes sense. At least to me, it makes sense. So that at least what they're saying in this article that I um that I just pulled up on here, this analyst uh, over here is saying that this will sort of cancel out the moves that OPEC has done, particularly the Saudis, you know, when, when uh, they were they, they could back uh, production. They're also extending the 1 million barrels per day production cut into September, and they're saying that they'll extend it probably beyond September as well because of what's happening in China. And, um, well, you know, actually, I do want to vent a little here because it's not it's not like these evil overlords uh, from, from the OPEC countries want to push oil to 500 bucks because they will make a bunch of money if that happens. Sure, they would make a bunch of money if that happened. But looking at what they've been doing recently, they, they're just, they're businessmen. They need, they need growing prices. They need high prices. But most of all, they need stable prices that are payable and by their clients that are demanding more oil. So that's what they really want. They want to sell oil at reasonably high prices, uh, not kill off their own demand, right? So their actions, as far as I understand it, uh, earlier this year were mostly about managing the price, not squeezing it higher to new all-time highs uh so if that was your bull thesis i don't know i i don't i don't quite understand a bull thesis of oh you know opec is going to save me they're going to squeeze my price to 500 bucks or whatever it might be so when they announced cuts earlier this year you know many ran to twitter to say that it, it was it was bullish oil and well it actually has been right that the oil has has gone up uh a little bit but just not in a proportions that most claim that it would be because because, yeah, this was never really intended to put a rocket under the price of oil. It was meant to put a floor under it because they were, well, the, the Saudis were really more right on China's demand than you and I have. And so they've been managing that by cutting supply. 
And so now the Chinese only have a um, um, 14 million barrel order for November delivery, whereas that number was well into the 20s um, earlier this year. It was at uh, 22 million in uh, 22 million barrels in June. This, by the way, comes on on top of the news coming out of Iran this week. Iran, um, by the way, is not an OPEC country, so OPEC cannot, I guess, legally stop them from increasing production. I guess they could go to war with them. That wouldn't be too surprising. Hopefully, they don't, of course. But and so apparently, that's that's exactly what Iran is planning on doing. Nobody can stop them from increasing production. And the country's vice president um, showed up this week saying that sixty seven. Uh, oil and gas projects uh, w- were going to be operational. New oil and gas projects were going to be operational by next March. And that's expected to already be uh, felt in the short term as well, because they are promising to up their o- oil production for around from, excuse me, around 3.18 million barrels per day to around 3.5 million barrels per day. But here's um here's the catch and, and why I'm bringing this up in the first place. China is Iran's biggest oil customer with about 1.5 million barrels of Iranian oil um, going towards China daily. Well, one point, not daily, I said it wrong, but it's it's 1.5 million barrels a day of their production goes to China. So out of the 3.18 million barrels per day of production right now, 1.5 million barrels per day uh, was meant for China. Well, with China slowing down its imports of oil, but Iran growing its oil production, where is all this going to end up? I don't have that answer. I'd like to ask somebody that question. I've stayed away from oil. I haven't done oil interviews, although um, they're very doomsdaysy and they get a lot of views. So I might have to do one. Um, but I don't understand the market well enough. Although I'm, st- I guess I'm starting bits by bits to understand some parts of the oil market. But definitely, it's just too deep. It's uh, too dependent. It's dependent on many factors. It's it's incredibly financialized. It's incredibly politicized geopolitics and so on and so forth. So it's nearly impossible to be consistently right on oil, especially if you're me. So I try not to share my opinions that would be worthless, um, as worthless as hiring a broker to be your marriage counselor, which I might very well have to do one day. But so instead, I try to just go over the news and tell you what I found during the week. But again, the, the, is all other things. This is going to have to be a team effort. So for the connoisseurs among you, all, go to the comments and, and talk to me about oil and And to my fellow plebs who know nothing about oil like me, go to the comments and read them and see where I was wrong and and be part of the discussion. This is sort of the um, this is what I'm trying to simulate here. But again, can and must go up. These news are not not necessarily telling me that oil must go up over the next six months. Maybe. Well, sure, it can, but it doesn't have to because oil producers are by far not struggling. They're pretty much printing money like there's no tomorrow at $80 a barrel. So there's not. There's no immediate reason for oil to go up the way that I see it now. And I guess many, one of my main takeaways from this whole fiasco with China is, at least since I've been following China, is that, and I, I was following it during the lockdown, so sort of when I started following it, is that this is, this is why theses that are supply-driven are just better theses, theses. <laughs> that's why, that's, for example, why I prefer uranium over lithium over, or over oil. Um, over the next five years. But I do understand the appeal of oil and copper and so on and so forth over the next 20 years. Because again, I believe we're not investing sufficient funds in mining and exploration of natural resources. There's a big ESG push that's hurting oil and coal too. Um, did I say oil and copper? I meant oil and coal. Um, and, and that's on a global scale too. But I, I'll rant more about that as we move forward, I guess. But the point is, yeah, that I don't see the must for oil to go up over the short run. I do see the, uh, an absolute must for oil to go up over um, over over a decade's period. Now, having mentioned copper, though, you guessed it, it, it the short term isn't looking too good for copper either. That's because Chinese inventories of copper have fallen to um, well very low levels. It's just about um, apparently there's just about three days worth of uh, copper demand that's in uh, Chinese inventory, which is. This is very unusual for them. Uh, there, there could be two reasons here. Now, you know, if you took the oil logic where they, the Chinese stocked up on cheap oil before the price went up and they were right to do so because the price did go up, what does that tell us about them not having, um, or about them not having stocked up on, on copper right now? Well, I'm, I'm shooting with my eyes closed in a dark closet here, but I'm guessing that it means that Chinese are not, the Chinese are not expecting the price of copper to go up over the short run. So they are not too worried. They're not stocking up too much on too much copper. 
which is curious because usually the real estate sector in China picks up um, around um, at, at around the September October period. So maybe, just maybe, just an idea. This has something to do with the struggling property sector that I went through at the beginning of this episode. But what if this rate cut in China works out well for the property sector and Evergrande settles their debt properly and so on and so forth? What if you know theoretically we see a soft landing in China and then an immediate takeoff, V-shaped recovery? Uh, or sort of a, a slow recovery and then a V-shaped recovery, whatever that might be called. Um, I'm sure people have a very creative word for it. But surely that will then matter for copper prices, given how low the inventories uh, at the futures exchanges are. Well, I see the logic, but that's not what purchasing managers in China think. See, Zhang came in, a purchasing manager at Hubei Xiadai Refined Copper Technology, said, and I'm quoting, Spot supply is plentiful in the market, and it's easy to source material as long as you pay a good price, unquote. And apparently there is a um, market workings shift in China where, and I'm going to have to quote again, uh, Chinese smelters have recently invested more money into manufacturing value-added products using some of their own refined metal, reducing the need to send supplies into warehouses. This is coming from a uh, copper tube maker, by the way. The quote continues, this is also more direct. There is, excuse me, I need to learn how to read. But the quote continues, there is also more direct delivery between smelters and consumers. The same person is saying, and he's apparently the client to be identified, whatever that might be, but unquote. Yeah. So yet again, one data point suggesting a more short-term payment for the demand of copper um, out of China, which is the largest consumer of copper. And apparently purchasing managers are not too worried about the supply because they say, don't look at these uh, above ground inventories that are reported on future, future exchanges. We've got plenty of copper. We're going to figure it out. Now, Chinese copper imports haven't really been dandy this year. Uh, although, you know, they say they have plenty, but their imports have not been really too high. And if you look at this headline that I have on here, China's imports of refined copper hit four year low. This is what the headline says. And yeah, Chinese imports of copper this year have been on the lower end, you know, they're the lowest in four years, as this says. And uh, this is only judging by the first half of 2023. And with the potential for a contracting property sector activity and manufacturing activity, as I've been reporting over the last couple of weeks, uh, yeah, a couple of weeks, really, it seems things will be getting worse for copper imports over the rest of the year. And um, actually, things are going to get way worse. And this is like 100% certainly here because Jim Cramer tweeted this week saying that he's bullish China. He's not worried one bit which in normal people's words means that China is about to become a wasteland at the quickest pace ever. And I'm kidding, of course, because my main ability is to be a clown, as you would know. I don't know how you haven't figured that out and haven't left yet, but if you're still here, I mean, I don't know, maybe something's wrong with you. But the point is China is not doing too well, and that's hurt most metals over the short run. Um, and it's going to keep hurting them, I think. But wait, I know, I know one thing. I want to go through that. It's probably going to make this video too long, but... The green economy will matter over the short run, right? Because our authoritarian governments will, this is going to be red, they will literally force us using the police that we literally pay for to buy, I don't know, electric cars with solar panels on top or something silly like that. Well, possibly, you know, I can see that happening in the West. I don't want to get too political. But they, they made us wear, wear face diapers uh, for a long while. But the push is apparently not happening at the pace that we might have expected to uh, expected it to happen across the world. Okay, I'm going to quote this headline here. Indonesia delays investment plan for $20 billion climate deal, unquote. Remember the $20 billion deal that Joe Biden nearly forced upon Indonesia, the one where, um, again, he, he nearly he almost forced this upon them to go for a $20 billion loan so that they can literally kill their energy sector and, and build, you know, um, uh, idealistic, um, unreliable energy sources. By the way, their, their, their energy sector is heavily dependent on coal, as you would know. Well, they're now pushing back on the launch of it. They're not saying it's not going to happen, but they're going to, they're, they're saying that it's going to be delayed. And I'm mainly bringing this up because I've been reporting on nations left and right that are pushing back against the silly climate plans that are really nearly forced upon um nations across the world from um from a western from a western angle so yeah i don't like that way i don't like that word by the way climate because this is this is nothing to do with climate and everything to do with total control but 
I said, I'm just not going to get too political because many countries are pushing back on it. Okay. And the energy transition, as it was promised to us in uh, 2015 and, and or w- whenever it might have been, it's just not happening on that time frame. It's not happening anytime. So it's not happening by 2025 or 2030 or, or even 2050, if it ever is. So again, I want to emphasize that although I'm not a fan of, of, of top-down investing, but top-down investing, by the way, is where you pick a sector and you allocate um, following following a framework. Then, for example, you know, you know, you're going to look at the economy. You're going to say, okay, I think that we're going to have quite a lot more batteries, so I'm going to go in, into lithium, and I'm going to buy three uh, producers and two developers and one explorer and uh, one royalty, whatever it might be. I'm not a fan of that type of way of thinking that's called top down uh, as you know i myself pivoted to uh, i used to be a fan of that but I, I i pivoted and i'm trying um the bottom-up approach now which basically puts emphasis on the individual companies and so i take it the other way around i look at first of all i'm going to look at the companies number one first i'm trying to specialize in recognizing real discoveries before the market does but that's not for everybody i do this absolutely on the daily it's pretty much become my job so for for the people who have studied their own situation and picked the top down approach, which is absolutely nothing wrong with that, it works out for quite a lot of people. So if it's if it's fitting for your own portfolio, do that. But so for the people who have picked that, all of this that I'm saying today, and I know I'm repeating myself, but all of this is proof to me that a supply shortage driven thesis is much better than a demand growth driven one, which is. Again, which is why when someone tells me that, for example, the growth in, in, in uranium demand is going to be slow and therefore they don't like uranium as, as a sector to invest in, I make sure, for the, well, first of all, I make sure to tell them they're wrong because um, because of overfeeding reactor life extensions, restarts, SMR, and so on and so forth. But I also tell them that even if demand for uranium would just not grow, it would just remain here for the next five years, which it won't. But if it did, the price of uranium will still need to go up because the market is simply undersupplied. And I'll I'll get to uranium, by the way, here in, in a few minutes. I'm not going to say to I should control myself and stick sort of to the script that I have over here because otherwise it's going to get chaotic. But if you ignore all these intra-week or intra-month moves, if you've gone for the top-down approach and you ignore these intra, intra-month moves or news around copper, oil, gold, coal, and so on and so forth, as you should, by the way, and you add on to your um, to your specifically money making, self sustaining, no debt businesses that you have exposure to, and you keep um, a sort of a decade plus time frame. I have it hard to believe that you would be heard, because because we simply aren't investing enough money in replacing the commodities that we use, and that's obviously true for all of the above. It's not only copper, or not only oil, or not only gold that I talked about. So. I mean, you can watch and listen to these news for entertainment, uh, which is the only way that you should r- be really using this information. But but if you ignore all of this over a long enough time frame, and if you add on to quality businesses that are making money, they don't have to dilute you into the stratosphere and they're not going to go bust. Yeah, again, I have a hard time believing that over the next 10, 20 years, you're, you're going to be hurt. Um, but what do I know? This actually ties nicely into the last headline that I want to go um, over here today before I go into uranium. And this is just um, another addition that, um, well, well, we in the West, and th- by the way, this includes Mexico. Mexico's growing red tape, uh, which in between news here, Mexico's Mexico's growing the red tape humongously. Like they're even pushing Newman to rethink its exposure to the country. And Newman loves Mexico. And but I'm not spending too much time on this because it's just another drop in the uh, growing red tape bucket. But well, but so while that's happening in the, in the West, while we are growing our red tape, the Saudis, this is the next headline, the Saudis are silently but surely entering the market. And businessmen in the mining sector are noticing this, and they're going to take advantage of this. You know, last week, I talked about Robert Friedland, the copper entrepreneur. Uh, this week, it's Mark Bristow. Mark Bristow is probably the most important person in gold. Uh, the more, excuse me, the most famous person in gold. He's probably one of the more important ones too, because he's a CEO of Barrick. Barrick is the second biggest gold company in the world. And he said, and I quote, the Western world has become extremely myopic, driven by instant gratification. If you haven't figured that out, he does not mince his words, by the way. Another quote goes, the sovereign wealth funds like the PIF came with a much larger horizon, creating a very exciting opportunity for Barrick. Unquote. So th- this comes as a response 
um, well, this came as a response during uh, during an interview last week in which uh, Bristol said that he's open to bringing in Saudis to finance his gold and uh, copper mine impact. It was not last week. Anyways, he said that he wants to work with the Saudis on financing that um, big mine in Pakistan. And this is, of course, as I've been chewing on for a few weeks now, this comes after the Saudis took a big, nice piece out of Valet, um, about 10%, I believe. So again, yeah, while we keep filling up the red tape bucket in the West, the Saudis keep filling up their investments in mining projects across the world bucket and control of global resources. And they're not even the only ones. They're not even the biggest ones, obviously, because while China might be struggling over the short run, the Chinese have never been short-sighted. Okay, and again, to 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 repeat what I've what I've been telling uh, for a couple of weeks now, I believe maybe it was last week's episode that I emphasized that the Chinese foreign investments in metals and mining this year, only for the first half of this year, have already surpassed their investments for last year. So they're basically breaking records upon records, and they're they're focusing on controlling as big part as big piece of the resource market as possible. And they're going to succeed if they keep going like that, unless there is a sudden change in the way that politics in the West deals with mining. And not only the politically correct lithium and copper and so on and so forth, but all mining, including oil and coal, which, yes, we're still going to need over the next five decades. So I guess there's a joke about Greta Thunberg in there, but I'm going to leave that to you. And I guess enough of that. I'm going to need a breathing break. I might not have a soul being a ginger and all, but I do have lungs. Um... So let's talk about uranium. Uranium is um it's uran it's time for uranium. It's it it's time for uranium in this episode, but it's also time for it in the markets. Um and as my friend Energy Burrito would say, this uh when when is this bull market happening? Well, it's happening right now. And as also as Lobo Tigre said on Twitter this week, this is the uranium market, this is not inevitable or imminent. It's happening right now. Considering that UXC was reporting prices of above $58 per pound, $58.25 to be specific, I tend to believe them. This is a very, very significant increase in the spot price for one week. It's actually up 3% this week alone, and it's completely erased the uh, brief correction that we had in mid-June, mid uh, which when that started, everyone assumed, okay, we're going into the summer doldrums. This is going to be a painful summer for uranium. It's going to fall a couple of percent. This was the sixth week of uranium gains right in the middle of the summer when there's virtually nobody in the spot market. When Sput was trading at a forever discount to NAV and has stayed out of the market, Sput has not bought any 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 uranium on the market for months. Zuri is not been buying, and Yellowcake bought a little bit, but they bought it from Kazanum Prom directly, and they're also trading at a 10% discount to NAV. This is the highest the uranium spot price has been since April of 2022. So that's almost a year and a half, and we are a ten, we are a, this. If the uranium price goes up ten percent from here to the upside, we're ten percent move away from new twelve year highs. Which again, considering that, as far as I know, there are no large buyers in the spot market. This is very much possible to happen when they do return, and well, because the big the big financial players are going to return into the spot market sooner or later. And, um, you know, just like Uranium Insider pointed out, by the way, last time the Uranium spot price got close to 60 and then above it, of course, that was all driven by spot in the spring of last year. This was also on the back of um, of the, 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 the Ukraine war having just started. This time, though, spot's been out of the market for almost six months, as I said. This market is changing. The Uranium spot market is no longer as liquid as buyers might need it to be. And this is on top of the replacement rate contracting that we are it's almost impossible not to go into it anymore. So the spot market is, is tight. Term market is also tight. And that's also happening while the sentiment in the broad market when it comes on to, you know, unpopular risk on assets is completely in the toilet. And on a week where the thing that actually makes uranium miners and developers valuable without being physical uranium, of course, when that thing goes up in a, uh, goes 3% up in a week, their stocks were caught falling. So while the spot price is up 30%, the URNM ETF was down 1%. And its little brother, the URNJ, was down 2.5% this week. So yeah, this is, it seems like this time is different. I I, I, I do understand what I'm saying. Uh, and those are uh, most of the times those are silly words, but it this market just seems different. It's an interesting market. I guess to honor what I've uh, what I've probably written in the title of this video, there have been some inflows of institutional capital into the uh, bigger names in the sector. Now, well, or 
into the big name in the sector, which is, there's really only one, with that being chemical, of course. And it's uh, it's it's widely known, and I've also reported on that throughout the year that Stanley Druckenmiller likes trading Cameco. He bought some Cameco shares in Q4 of last year, and then he sold all of it in Q1 of this year, booking a small profit. And then he's now he now appears to be back in Cameco with a larger position this time. It's about a thirty million dollar position. Now, not only the drug was buying Cameco in Q2, by the way. Um, looking at this type of size of institutions. Um, there have been uh, about $31 million worth of shares of Cameco bought and $26.8 million uh, worth of it sold. Generally, this is actually a calm quarter. There's normally bigger money flows uh, when it comes down to institutions. So there wasn't much institutional volume in Cameco. And other buyers, by the way, included, he was not the only one, as I said. So other buyers were Ray Dalio, Joel Greenblatt, and Stephen Cohen. Stephen Cohen, by the way, has the largest position of all of them, of about $53.5 million. That's the market value of his position. So it's pretty big. On the seller's side, there was uh, Jim Simmons. Did I say Gene Simmons? It's not Gene Simmons. This is not Kiss. It's Jim Simmons. And there's also Ken Griffin. They haven't sold out of their positions completely, as uh, both of them are still larger shareholders of Cameco than Stanley is. So they're at a respective value of $46 and $33 million. So pretty big shareholders of Cameco. Um, but while well, Jim Simmons was was he, he's just generally trimmed his overall exposure to uranium. He sold some next gen. He sold Denison, and he was also selling um, some energy fuels, I believe. Well, Ken Griffin, on the other hand, seems to be getting more concentrated because he's moving money around within the space. Because he added to his position of next gen, he bought Encore, and he even bought some Denison. After cutting a portion of his exposure to Gamaco, as I said, and that's a this is a development that I actually like seeing because although obviously I believe that 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 Gamaco is a is a much m many dozens of times better company than just about any other company in the sector simply because it's a real business and most of them aren't. I like seeing this development in the market because it's suggesting to me that people who follow this market closely are already starting to go down the quality trail as their expectations for the real move having started. Um, are improving, so they're willing to take the risk because they think that when the tide comes in, it's going to lift all boats, and the ones that might have holes in them, ironically enough, oftentimes go the highest. So, um, both ways, though, I look at these, uh, you know, large sort of superstar money managers and their positions, and I conclude that the generalist's money has not yet arrived in this sector. Sure. You know, Kathy Wood's been adding bits and pieces of Cameco to the, um, I believe, Autonomous Energy Fund or something like that. And then Dalio and the drug have bought, but they all bought Cameco, the most obvious bellwetter in the space. And and the drug and Kathy, by the way, are known for being, um, let's call it courageous. You know, they're often first movers. They're, their whole brand is built upon that. Uh, well, Dalio will, he just buys everything. He's got like 700 stocks or something among those lines. And I'm, Sorry to lose my trust in him. Although some of his teachings are good, his returns have not been bad, but that's a story for another time. But point is, I think we're still very, we're still early. I'm not going to say very early, but we're still early in the uranium market. Things are starting to move. These are not the first innings, but we're still early. Basically, nobody who's been dealing with um, enormous sums of money is aware of this sector and the opportunities in it. Aside your, you know, Segura Capital, shout out to Art. Uh, or Gordon and Rosenzweig, so shout out to Adam. Been a while since I uh, spoke to to either of them, by the way. I should, I should right my wrongs, but and a few other smaller funds that are in there, of course. Uh, but they're not managing billions of dollars as far as um as far as I know. Um e even people who spend a lot of time online and, and you know do podcasts and whatnot are not not properly aware of the opportunities in the sector, in my opinion. Um, where I'm coming from, by the way, is you've probably heard about Wealthian. It's um, it's a podcast. It's normally a sort of a doomer macro podcast, but they recently hosted our friend Uranium Insider on there. So I guess they know about the thesis. Well, my friend, my other friend, I don't have many of them. So my other friend, Mark Tovey, he spoke to one of the one of the frequent guests on that podcast this week. His um, his name is Lance Roberts, and uh, his he's a portfolio manager and a market strategist and an overall smart guy. So I'll play, Mark asked him um, uh, about commodities in general, but more specifically about uranium and gold. And so I'll play you his answer, what, what Lance told him here is, I think this will give you an idea of where generalists, smart investors, but generalists 
stand on this sector. So let's uh, let's watch that on here. This channel is called Resource Talks, and most of the listeners have a bias towards investing in physical metal funds or, or mining companies. So I have to ask you, do you have any um, allocation to commodities? Not right now. Um, we don't at the moment because, you know, we, we had positions before. Um, we trade commodities more than we hold them because commodities are a tradable asset. They basically, in a lot of cases, they have no underlying revenue stream. They have no dividend yield, et cetera. So the, the, the issue is for us is that they're more of a tradable position. And we haven't owned a lot of hard commodities here as of late. We own a few, like uh, we own some companies uh, in our portfolio, like Albemarle for lithium and, and some companies like that. But we don't need direct metals because of the lack of income that, that come from them. Again, no dividend yield or interest income stream. And they are a pure play in terms of just an ex expectation on changes of commodity prices. And uh, again, gold as a factor has not performed well over the last couple of years. And so one of the things that we try to, to, to watch very carefully in our portfolio is drag. So if we have a position that's not performing, then that's something we don't want to own until it starts for positive benefit to the is it, is it necessarily um, just a short-term trading position, though, if you've got sort of a long-term thesis about the adoption of nuclear energy or something? Couldn't it make sense to buy um, just a physical uranium holding or, or a big uranium miner like Cameco for the long term? Yeah, if you believe that nuclear energy is going to be a big adoption um, and that we're going to go back to building nuclear power plants, then that's that that would be a logical, you know, logical play. Um, you know, and again, buying the company would probably be a better way to do that. But, you know, there's, you know, where we're headed right now, the focus is anti-nuclear because nuclear bad, oil bad, we have to do everything in batteries, which makes no sense. But that's the way that the world is focused right now. Um, it takes 10 years to build a nuclear plant. We just opened up a new one in, I think, Louisiana just recently. Um, you know, so it takes 10 years to get one of those off the ground. So if we're going to start even talking about, you know, getting more towards nuclear energy, we got to start those talks today because by the time you even crack ground on one, that would be five years out. Then it'd be another 10 years to actually get the thing up and operating. So you've got to have a really, really long time horizon. If your idea is to buy nuclear energy and it's going to be the thing, you're going to have to have a 20-year window for that play to play off. All right, look, I don't, I don't want to pick on Lance or anything like that. So this is not his area of expertise. Lance is a smart guy, okay? He's a, he's a generalist, though. So this serves as a beautiful example, in my opinion, that we're still early and that generalist's capital hasn't entered the space as it eventually, inevitably will. While the spot price is suggesting that something different is happening in the market as we speak, and that right there, I think, is a very, very interesting situation that I think is going to wake up a lot of generalists, but like, you know, in a snap all of a sudden. So we'll see. Is it a, a gradual rise that over time is going to get money in the sector? Could be, could also just be a snap. Don't get me wrong, though. Being early is not easy, and it's going to be met with a lot of fear and certainties and doubt as it, as, as it is in most cases. But the truth is that most people... Most people are, will be late to this trade. They're, most people are often late to, to the commodity space, and generalists often are left holding the bag. They get um, afraid and, and, and sort of disappointed with the sector overall, and they, they go out of it for another 10 years, and they come back when they see it start getting interested and stuff like that. You know, I, I'm early. I've been early. I've actually could have made um, quite a lot of money in uranium if my head was on my shoulders and not inside one of my bodily cavities. Because I was um I was in New York, I was talking about uranium publicly in 2018, 19 ish. Um but anyways, that's me. I messed it up personally. The thesis didn't do anything wrong. But you're either early or you're late. Or you're lucky, I guess. Most people are not early, and an even smaller number of people is lucky. And most people are late. None of these things are wrong, by the way. I'm I'm not I'm 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 not bringing this up to tell you, oh, go ahead and buy uranium stocks right now. I cannot do that. Because different strategies work for different people and different investor profiles and different psychological uh, profiles and different financial situations and so on and so forth. I, I cannot give advice to 20,000 people simultaneously. <laughs> I wish to twenty to 2,000 people simultaneously. But I can tell you that you need to be, pick one of those. Okay, You need to choose to either be early 
which is, is now, uh, be lead, which is somewhere in the next three years, or just be lucky and bottom tick this whole thing. So I, I, I sincerely wish you can do that. And I wish you luck if this is your strategy. But whatever you pick, pick one that works for you, for your personal situation, for your emotional profile, and so on and so forth, for your psychological profile, for you. the amount of money that you can risk, your skill set, the amount of risk capital that you have, because this is a risky sector. And just stick with it. Pick one that you want to do without being emotionally influenced by what's being said or done online by whoever else. And if you cannot do that, just exit exit out of the echo chambers. There's no reason to watch this. Um, I mean, if you, if you decided that it's too early for you and you, you cannot take the waiting and the drawdowns that will inevitably happen, that will keep happening in the sector, and you've decided that you, you're going to wait for a breakout and confirmation, that's when you're going to enter missing a little bit of the upside, but having, you know, sort of downside protection. If that works out well for you, if that's who you are, if you know when a breakout has happened and you can recognize it and you can ride that wave to the upside, don't be influenced by, you know, nothing, nowhere, knowing ginger randomly on the internet like myself. Don't listen to anybody on Twitter. Don't get into these echo chambers. Just listen to yourself. You're the only person who actually cares about your money. So pick one. Are you going to be early? Are you going to be late? Or are you going to get lucky? Pick one and try to go for it. If you pick the get lucky one, tell me how you're doing that because I haven't been getting lucky in a while. Moving on, I've also tried reporting on the uh, growing bifurcation of the uranium market because I believe it's a very important... I say that about a lot of things, don't I? But when it, this is an actually very important thing because uh, this thing... This is actually because of the, oh, I'm going to go back. This is because of the chart that I keep bringing up every Sunday. This this, this, this is the chart I probably have on your screen right now. The chart that shows OECD supply and the OECD demand on top of the non-OECD supply and the non-OECD demand. So the West versus the East. And so this week, Borja on Twitter, keep bringing him up every week. Big shout out. You have to follow him on Twitter. But so he reported on Twitter that Kazakh exports to Russia in the first half of 2023 well, they grew by nearly 40%. So this is another point to utilities hoping to get their hands on cheap and quick Kazakh supply, which, by the way, is neither cheap nor quick. As, uh, as of the recent reports, by the way, we keep seeing hundreds of millions of dollars needed for sustaining CapEx, as well as uh, growing OPEX, uh, growing cost of production, growing times to production, and so on and so forth. But so if... If OECD utilities were hoping for this um, for this, this production just to magically fall into their hands... Um, at, at the snap of their fingers, like they were used to for over ten years, you cannot blame them because that's the market they got used to. They got they, that the markets that they got experienced in. Well, this news here suggests that that ain't happening. But also, Kazakhstan is currently working on building its own nuclear power plant. It's definitely not far up that process, but they currently have no operational power plants. Uh, so their supply of uranium ends up across the globe. Uh, well, not now primarily uh, to the north and to the east. To China and I guess to the northeast as well, but they're they're um they're moving up the process. They are now uh, at the public hearing stage for a nuclear power plant. It's not a sure thing. It's not for today or tomorrow. But again, this is a perfect example of what the uranium insider always says: skate to where the puck's going, not where it's been. And so Kazakhstan also announced um, who the possible builder of said reactors might be, and they said that it it might be Korea, but it also might be China or Russia. That's basically their short list. So if you had any doubts as to who Kazakhstan is siding with during this new um, Cold War, then uh, bits and pieces of news like these should should help you clear those doubts. But, okay, all, all of this demand is way up in the future, okay? Definitely not for today or tomorrow. But you know what is? Reactor life extensions. News came in on Monday from France that the country has approved its first ever reactor life extension beyond the 40-year time mark that reactors were normally supposed to operate. This is the Trikastan nuclear power plant that uh, has now gotten green light to operate for another 10 years. What's more important for this specific piece of news is that this is only one of the 32, so 32, 32 reactors of this type that France built between 1977 and 1988. Just in between, by the way, notice the period of 11 years. This makes it an average of three reactors per year built in that period. So this is just a small point here. That if there's a will, there's a way. Those reactors have operated, operated safely ever since they were built quickly and they were built cheaply. But anyways, this is, yeah, this is a, um, this is a side note. But EDF, the owner of, uh, of those reactors, said that from the ones that are still operational among those 32 reactors, 
they are going to apply the same procedures and uh, I guess try to get reactor life extensions and all of them. So this is actually very important news because reactor life extensions is immediate demand for uranium. This is this is really the new reality. This is where the puck is going to. Um, it's starting to arrive. It's not completely there yet. Uh, but this will be a normal thing, just like I reported on Sweden last week. I believe countries will start pivoting in, back into nuclear. I believe Germany is going to do it. Germany, um, I believe the people in Germany are getting fed up with the current political situation, uh, as, as Mark Nelson reported on Twitter. And they're also getting fed up with not having, um, you know, clean, cheap, reliable energy. And France, of course, is not the only country making moves towards nuclear. Uh, Europe is not the only continent doing that. And the Canadian government this week also announced up to $74 million of funding for small modular reactors. Again, not immediate demand, but a clear example of major sentiment shifts. Uh, and, and that's what we're currently undergoing in the sector. And for, for, for those of you who are thinking that mines will be cheap and easy to build, it's like, okay, but when the price of uranium goes to like 70, then all of a sudden we have all this supply because, you know, cyclical and, and, and so on and so forth. Well, I, I have another interesting piece of news this week coming out of uh, Iran, where uh, we see that Iran has broken ground on its new, uh, on, on a new uranium mine. Most people, <laughs> most people's hair is probably standing up when they hear uranium and uh, Iran, but Iran is actually planning on building a, a nuclear fleet um, for about a, a total of uh, 20,000 megawatts of nuclear capacity. So pretty ambitious plan, pretty big nuclear plans. And um, they've been, well, it's Iran, you know, they've been, you know, what's been happening there. They've not necessarily been the most supported country out there for the last 50 years. So they, um, they don't want to depend on anybody for their fuel, which would be logical. You know, you think that would make sense for any country out there, but Western politicians wouldn't agree with you. But so Iran is trying to build its own mine. Obviously it's all government work. So there's no direct investable vehicle there. But the interesting part is that the, the, the number one, I guess, even with basically no red tape, because this is government work, not relative to what we have in the West, at least, they're working with a construction schedule of 30 months for this mine. This is two and a half years. And the first phase of the project, they say, is going to cost them at least $240 million U.S. dollars, a quarter of a billion dollars. Now, that is considering that they get it built on budget and on time, by the way, which is not necessarily usual in the mining industry and again this is this is not your typical route uh, that mining companies go uh, of your you know scoping study into what a PEA and then into a PFS and then into a feasibility study and then into a finan final investment decision and then uh, environmental studies and then studying the animals and the soil and the plants and so on and so forth and then start looking for financing and so on and so forth this is as far as I understand it they're skipping all of that and they're just starting to build the mine which I'm not advocating for doing in the West, of course. I'm just saying what they are doing and how long it will take them, which again, even skipping all these steps, it's going to take them two and a half years. And I'm also saying how much it's going to cost them, which is going to be, in the best case scenario, a quarter of a billion dollars. So no, bringing uranium mines into production is not easy. It's not cheap and it's not quick. So for people thinking that new supply can come out of nowhere, it really can. It, it's really it, 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 it's really not fast, cheap, as I said, okay? Um, not in Iran, not in Kazakhstan, and definitely not in Northern America. Okay, so again, I can, I can keep talking about uranium for hours. Um, maybe come to the Discord server if you want to talk about it for hours. I'm on there quite a lot. I would say 24-7, but that would be a lie. So just go to resourcetalks.com. Uh, it's a chat platform where you can connect to other users. It's uh, free to use. It's incredibly easy. You don't need an email request or anything like that. But the conclusion here really for uranium is that the market is behaving differently. And it it will be it's just going to be very interesting to see what happens from September onwards when all the fuel buyers are back from vacation and they get to hear all the stories at the at, um, WNC uh, nuclear conference in London, sometimes mid-September, early September, I believe. It's just a very interesting time in the uranium market. And I'm looking forward to what's going to happen then. Uh, as we're also crossing, again, I didn't talk about it too much in this one, but as we're crossing replacement rate contracting, uh, we're likely already above it. But uh, it's also an interesting time in the overall mining and and and, and junior mining market with, um, by the way, uh, as Luke and I have been uh, discussing over recent weeks, you know, we have dropping volumes, struggling companies left and right. Good news is not really good news because it's not moving the stocks as much as it would normally if there was volume in the market. So, um. Is, is this really the bottom for junior stocks? Well, 
I guess my wife sure hopes it is. But uh, let's hear from Luke Denhava. He's the founder of golddiscovery.com and the Drill Alert app, by the way, which if you're a serious investor in this sector, you need this app. It's free to use. Um, so you should check it out. But let's hear from him and see what he thinks. All right, Luke. So it seems like you're still on vacation. So I guess I'm supposed to be happy for you. But when I look out the window, it's getting increasingly more tough for me to be happy for you. But I guess I'll just say that I'm happy for you. Um, but looking at the list is also, I don't know, there's not much that stands out to me. There's a few things that you have highlighted on here, but not no big moves. The, the biggest move that's on here is Loyal Lithium, 75.5% up. Um, big volume. It's an Australian stock again. So yeah, take it away and tell me what's happening. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this week, um, mostly ASX uh, gainers. Last couple of weeks, we saw the Canadians uh, more present in the gainers, so it was hopeful. Finally, the TSX fee was contributing. Um, this week, a pretty weak uh, week again. Uh, companies are going down. The biggest uh, companies, mining companies, went down 5 6% on average. Uh, but Loyal Lithium stands out. Uh, another company with a visual discovery of pegmatites in Canada. Uh, it's a pretty new stock, I think. Went up almost three or four X in a couple of months on two lithium discoveries. And the market is still excited about lithium discoveries, apparently. Um, I'm not really a lithium guy, so I'm not the ideal person to evaluate this news. But um, the volume is probably saying enough. Uh, it must have some potential, but there's no drilling yet. The, on this project uh, in James Bay, uh, it's a visual discovery of spodumene pegmatite. Uh, and uh, it's a pretty interesting release to to look at it. Also, the pictures that they show mm -hmm. uh, with, with a geologist lying on the ground, showing the width of the system. But um, not for me, uh, but perhaps for people that are still interested in lithium stocks. It's... A He's a small geologist, though, because this <laughs> Bajamin Krista is one meter forty, and I'm I'm not the I'm, I'm about six feet, like so it gets to the meter eighty ish. But so if yeah, I don't know, he looks yeah, small. I, <laughs> I know I know nothing about pegmatites though or dikes. Yeah, uh, that was my first uh, when I saw the one meter forty intersection. I uh, I had to. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's um, it, it's an interesting sight to say the la the, the least. Um. Okay, what else? You have another another ASX company on here. Um, yeah, t take it away. Yeah, Noronex, um, I never heard of this company before. Uh, um, looked at the news. They are drilling in Namibia through 70 meters of cover, and they just hit, uh, they just went through the cover, and they confirmed that by this news release, and they confirmed that they are drilling. Um, no visuals, no other things than a drill announcement, which is a bit funny. Perhaps we will see something more about this company soon when they have some visuals or have some essays. But uh, I do have an interest in companies looking for copper in that part of the world. Um, so it's something on my watch list. I, I never heard of this company, so I highlighted it. Uh, but I have nothing more to say about them. And then the number three company is Spark. Uh, and the interesting part about this one is this is the third company in a very short period of time that goes up 50 or 40%, but some other companies went up uh, 100% on a lithium acquisition in Brazil. So apparently, uh, Solis Minerals sparked something uh, with their acquisition of lithium in Brazil because now a number of companies um, yeah, are acquiring land in Brazil for lithium and an announcement of this acquisition is enough for a company to go up uh, close to 50%. So another one that a company I don't really know, but um, sometimes if we if you discuss it a week, uh, a list like this week by week, you notice the similarities in reasons of moves. And that's clearly still lithium. And it's clearly still lithium acquisitions in Brazil. Uh, so that's the only reason I highlighted this one. Uh, another story, a very different one, is Shibugamu. This is one I know personally a bit more because I own it already for many years. And this is a company with a copper project, a pretty big copper project in Shibugamu. Uh, Shibugamu is a area in Quebec. And I think a number of companies tried already in the past years to consolidate all these projects 
because there are several copper mines, high-grade copper mines in this area. Um, Dory is a company that did it, and they are drilling already for a number of years. And Shibugumo owns the other half of the uh, region, you could say. And Toma Gold, which is a tiny company, really a tiny company, uh, they are acquiring this project uh, from Shibugumo uh, and from Sokwem. And uh, they must have a financier behind them because it's a $2 million company, Toma Gold. And they're buying the project for $3 million in cash, almost $3 million, and $3 million, $6 million in expenditure. And the other East Block, they have an option for $11 million from Shibugumu, which is more than the Shibugumu uh, market cap right now. Um, so this could be a new copper company in the making. And I mean Toma Gold in this case, if they have the backers... Um, to really pay for this because Toma Gold needs to fund perhaps 15 to 20 million, perhaps 20 million or more in the, in the coming three, four years. And you talk about a $2 million company. Uh, but this is, it's good sign, a good sign for Shibugumu. And they went up this week uh, by 32%. Um, so that's something interesting to follow. Uh, Toma Gold, I guess, will change their name and will probably do a big restructuring uh, to become that new copper company. What do you think about the whole district, by the way, the uh, Shibugumu district? That's a, it's a place of interest to me. I, I own a company with, with an asset there without being QC. Again, disclaimer, I, I do own it. But it seems to me like somebody, if something comes out of there, there's going to have to be consolidation. And so smaller projects that are now coming up with some interesting grades are also interesting to me because I think that sooner or later there is consolidation in the Shibugumu district. I don't know when, I don't know who's going to do it. Or how much they're gonna pay for it, but it—that's how it feels to me. What do you think? Yeah, it's an area that it, that is under constant uh, consolidation rumor, I would say. But also, Northern Superior uh, was a tiny, tiny company in 2019. It was a three million dollar company. Michael Gentile bought stock, and the stock went from seven cents to one dollar forty or something, and they started consolidating as well. On the gold front, uh, it's it's south of Shibugumu copper mines. Um, then you have Dore. Dore also did consolidation in the area. Um, I think you have uh, Van Gold. No, it's not Van Gold. Something with Van. There are a number of companies, Van Star, I think. A number of companies in the area that at some point will be consolidated, I think, to get bigger claim, blo- claim blocks and bigger you know, ideas um, of exploration rather than having all these tiny claims and, and, and no big plans to um, to explore. So it's probably a good sign that, that bigger groups are trying to consolidate the area and uh, and in the future, perhaps there are only three or four or five claim holders left instead of the 10 or 20 holders that there are right now. Hmm. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. It's going to be interesting to see. Well, I guess we're also going to have to start coming out of this Beer market though, and you also have a slide on that. Interestingly enough, that you called the uh, the go the, the the industry's million dollar question. Uh, you wrote an article on this in 2016. You called it the gold industry's million dollar question, uh, but it's really the, the the whole junior market's million dollar question, which is when will this bear market end? Indeed, and then you actually called it pretty tightly in 2016. So c- maybe you can try and answer that question for me now as well. When is this going to end? Yeah, the, the problem is that I am a, I'm a real stock picker and I think a lot of people see themselves as stock pickers in this market. And even though you pick the best stocks, if the market, uh, especially these junior mining markets, if they turn against you, there's just, I mean, the, the, the juniors went out down 80% on average, almost 70% on average in the last two years and, uh, and gold is stable or even up. So this is just a violent market. And in 2016, after a number of years in the markets, I felt the same way. And on the 23rd of January, I wrote an article uh, about gold, which I never did before, uh, about gold, but also about Newmont. I took Newmont as a sort of representative company for the sector uh, because the GDX, did, GDX and GDXJ didn't exist in 1996. So what I did, I compared the, the Newmont chart uh, from 1994 to, 1990, to 2001, I think, and I compared it to the 2000. 10 to 2016 chart and those charts were almost equal you know it was almost like a copy and i looked at the number of years and number of days and also at that point 
it was almost the same period of bear market and it was almost the same percentage, uh, 78% down versus 74% down. So I wrote the article and in hindsight, it was exactly almost spot on on the day the bear, uh, the, the bottom. Uh, and I, I'm not going to be able to do that again. Uh, you need some luck every now and then with these things. But um, I started looking today into uh, comparisons. I mean, the chart is not looking that great right now. If you compare it again in this way, uh, I have the impression that there may be another, uh, we may get another V-shaped bottom, which would mean that we get a, a little bit more pain in the coming months. Um, of course, these overlaying charts is, an, is a fun thing to do. I wouldn't say that's the best, you know, the best guideline to find your bear market end or your bottom. So what I also did is I looked at a couple of companies, like how did they behave at the end of the bear market? And what you typically see in most of these companies, even in the illiquid ones, but also in the more liquid ones, is that you get a number of days, four, five, six days of really big down moves. Um, I mean, in the in the more liquid names, of course, on liquidity, and in the in the smaller names, on very little liquidity, but still a number of minus five, minus six percent days in a row. And and really like capitulation. Um followed by not like like if you look at the chart, it's almost like an immediate rocket that goes up after that. And, and it's not like that in, in reality. Because if you look at it day by day, you get you get a couple of very good days after that, and then you get another nine percent smash down. Uh so as an investor in the market, if you have to analyze it day by day, you have no clue. Uh you think, okay, no. this might be a short rally for three days or four days and we go down again because you you have been conditioned to expect to go down again and uh, that's why it's so difficult if you look at a chart it's so easy to say like oh yeah that was the bottom and it went up in one straight line but even that straight line if you look at it on a day-by-day -day basis is with up and downs and uh, if you're in it and you feel you feel the you know uh, the pain of the thing going down or the excitement of the thing going up uh, it's way more difficult, and that's why I uh, that's why I looked at a number of stocks. I've got a, two of them with me right now: the GDX and Probe. Very different type of of products, but where you see that um, that the bottom in January isn't that obvious if you look at uh, look at it on a day by day basis. Uh, but when you look at the GDX in February, suddenly you see the volume going up almost every day, and you get a seven percent, five percent, six percent move up uh, in a row. Um, mm -hmm. So perhaps if you really want to jump in after the bear market ended, you have to wait for a moment like this where you really get a confirmation. But in the juniors, what you then see in the juniors is that a stock can go 30 or 40% up on almost no volume. And then suddenly you realize, oh, perhaps we are finally in that bull market and you missed the first 50%. So to play it in a in perfect way, I think is close to impossible or you need to be very lucky. That's sort of the conclusion I, I uh, draw when I uh, look at all these different pieces of evidence from the past. It's a good conclusion because, one, there's a lot of people out there pretending to know. And then, you know, they would publish things like, OK, sell or buy because they think, OK, now it's really when it's going to be. And you can try your luck and it's kind of funny when it works out. But it it, it is in big part luck. Now, you, you can, however, increase your your chances of getting lucky i guess if you if you stack up a couple of things i mean if you make a checklist of okay we have dropping volumes we have you know duration then you have you bring in other things from macroeconomics and so on and so forth to maybe get a sense of are we closer to the bottom or are we closer to the top or like do we seem like we're undecided so halfway something along those lines is more realistic i think but in the end you made a good point that at least it is my opinion, uh, and I know that it is it is your opinion. It, it's better to understand what you own than to know, um, than to try and guess when exactly to buy it. So what I mean by that is that that you need to look at the companies that you own, and you need to understand the companies that you own and what 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 catalysts might be driving them. Because as we're talking, we we've been talking for a couple of months now. Every week, there's a stock that's doubled. There's a couple of stocks that have doubled on, on good weeks. There's dozens of stocks that double. And if, if you knew and understand the company and understood the company before that, you, you could have participated in that run while the whole sector is going down. Um, so this is a decision that people need to make for themselves. Like, do you want to be, you know, a market timer, sort of a generalist, or do you want to be more of a specialist and understand one subsector of our crazy sector?
So I think those are all good points. Yeah, I, uh, that's exactly what it is. I think if you put, I mean, a significant amount of your capital into Aston Bay two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, you could have a phenomenal year at this moment. I mean, you could have, uh, I mean, you have to have the guts and the vision of, hey, at this moment, this stock is cheap because this news is completely changing in the game. I'm buying 20% of my portfolio and I'm not recommending this, but I'm just saying like as an example of Aston Bay right now and, and you would be up 4X on that investment, uh, which could completely save your portfolio for the year. Um, but if you look at, I mean, that, that's really picking a stock on news. What I'm also doing is looking at companies that are already cheap and they can always become cheaper. But if the insiders own enough, if the fundamental projects that they own or whatever they fundamentally do is really amazing and you know what they are doing and you know the risk of what they are doing and the stock is cheap and and, and in the best case, they even have some cash on the balance sheet for some reason uh, because they've raised money at higher levels and they still sit on that cash and they don't burn it too quickly. You could already be buying right now even if there's a potential drop coming because if you look at the seasonalities of this market, I'm not completely sure, but I don't think we've ever seen a real bottom in August or September. In most cases, these bottoms happen towards the end of the year, early in the year when the markets really turn, or perhaps earlier, in, maybe in April. But I, I cannot really recall a long-term bear market of at least two years, let's say, that suddenly ends in September and starts running. Uh, so my best guess is that we have a little bit at least either sideways markets to go or some some downside uh, that, that, that may be coming. Um, I always like the month of September, October, because that's when the best companies often start to already outperforming a little bit. Uh, some stocks go down up to December into the tax loss se- uh, selling season. But my experience is that the best stocks sometimes already bottom in, in the first or second week of October. Um, so I think the coming two months are going to be interesting for the for the market in general. Probably, if you are a macro news follower, I think there's a lot to come that um, that should answer a lot of questions in the coming months. So there's a lot of tension in the in the global markets. You know, the mining markets are difficult. You know, where are we exactly? Uh, but I think the coming two three months are going to be interesting. And um, even though there are there are opportunities already, maybe those opportunities will get better um, in the near future. And I think we will not really see a bottom until it hurts a little bit more and you get a couple of very difficult days. And perhaps that's coming. But uh, I'm not a technical trader. I'm just, tr- I mean, even if you're not, not a technical trader, you have to try to at least, ha- you know, attempt to know where you are in the market. Otherwise, you're just completely blind. Um, and this is how I look at it from a more like a, a mining markets perspective. Yeah, well, as as I said, to me at least, what's important is number one to understand the companies that I own. You know, have a um, a, a few eggs in my basket, but watch them extremely closely and know when might be a good time to buy or not. Like, is it a four month hold coming up? Are they going to have to raise money? Maybe I don't want to add now and wait for two months before they raise money. Or are they going into a quiet period where I know there's not going to be any news because they're in between drill programs or planning or something like that? I might attempt not to buy, but wait before I know that, okay, the season is coming up when they're going to have to come out with a plan to start drilling. The only way to know these things is to follow the company very closely, talk to management to understand it even better. And um, and, and yeah, but understand where you are in the market nonetheless. Are you closer to the top, closer to the bottom? Are you undecided? You know, there's this, this old saying, sell in May and go away and come back on Legger's Day or something along those lines. And um, Legger's Day this year is on September 16th. So that's about a month away. And um, it'll be interesting to speak back. Though obviously, that's not true all the time. Otherwise, we, we'd all be rich and AI would be working for us. But um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I um, I agree. It's, it, it is most important to watch your own stocks very, very carefully and know... Uh, you know, you know what what could drive the company, and indeed know what kind of uh, moments that are important for these stocks will come up, such as a four month hold period. Um, recently, I started a Twitter account called Cap Alert. Uh, it's probably a little bit for junior mining geeks, but uh, so I don't think it will attract a very big market. But what it do, what it does is it it tracks the financing closure date. 
And then after three months, it, it gives an audit alert automatically saying like, hey, within mon one month, this stock will be free trading. And if you think about it, and that's why I often emphasize the share structure and, and how to look at how the company finances. Because what you often see is that the company issues 20 million shares and 20 million warrants, for example. And what we also show is the volume in those stocks. So for example, today or yesterday, there was a stock uh, free trading within a month, 8 million shares and 8 million warrants. Average volume, we show in those tweets, 40,000 shares a day. So how can a market with 40,000 shares a day consume 8 million shares and 8 million warrants, especially if they are in the money or if they are above the financing price? And that's why these markets are so difficult. We issue millions of stocks, millions of shares we issue, and, uh, and the volume is... Tiny, tiny, tiny. So you need the generalist to come in, volumes go up for these stocks to finally go up again. Otherwise, there's just too much supply for most of these tiny stocks to go up uh, because every time they do a financing four, month later, four months later, these retail investors and perhaps funds start selling again. And uh, how, to, how to overcome that? Uh, only by doing good financings with good people, I think, and having the right projects and people running the company and or having a, a big bull market because then all the stocks typically go up uh, for a short period of time in most cases. So often it's only six to 12 months and then you get a bit of a lag again. Mm. Yeah, that's one thing that I, I also ask out of CEOs when I interview them. I ask them, who, who, who exactly are you going to be raising money with? Where are you going to place most of those shares and when they tell me something like well you know people or, or they give me the name of a broker and then i i keep pushing until i i understand who is going to be holding these shares and what do they want to do with them are they trading are they gonna write the free warrants and, and so you keep pushing through these things and sometimes it's interesting to me when ceos are surprised that i'm asking that question because they don't understand the significance of it and that in and of itself is actually already a good answer so that's a good point 100 percent well, I, th I think it's, you cannot, I, sometimes I want to repeat it, you know, you cannot think about it enough. 8 million shares of supply, 40,000 shares of volume per day. If you then see a financing with 150 participants, on average $10,000 per person, per participant, then there's only one thing that could happen is that, the pe that these people start selling after four months, especially when they need to raise cash again for the next deal. And uh and that's why it's so difficult. And sometimes that's why it makes it easy because these stocks go down so much that they get undervalued. And if you then start buying it in the market, it could even be a better moment than mm -hmm. owning a warrant because sometimes you can buy it at 50% discount of the placement price. And then you rather have a cheap free trading stock share than a, um, well, than a, than a unit, uh, including a warrant that is overpriced in hindsight. So I think the significance of, of death in these markets is uh, not to be forgotten. Mm. I agree. I agree. Okay, what else? What else do you have for me this week? Or do you want to go enjoy the sun? I'm probably going to enjoy the sun. I don't have much more. Uh, on the news front, there was not anything that, that really stood out to me. Um, perhaps other people see things that they and that they that excites them, but. Um, I didn't really see news that that excited me this week, and uh, uh, at least not in this list. Some companies went up less than twenty-one percent. The cutoff uh, points this week, uh, because sometimes what I what we don't have in a list is companies that go up on high volume. For example, Snowline going up another ten or fifteen percent, but not enough to make it to the list. Sometimes we discuss the small stocks, and not you know the big Snowlines who go up every week ten percent, but do not do not make it into the list, but in the long run, give a better return. So we have always have a little bit of a focus on these tiny stocks uh, or stocks with really value-changing uh, news. And that's why we don't often talk about these bigger stocks. All right, that's it. This has been long enough. It's probably been too long. And this is all that I'm allowed to tell you this week. So go to resourcestocks.com um, if you want to... Um... You know, if you if you if you if you want to chat um, with other people and with me, and otherwise, if you found anything of value in this report, please do let me know by I guess subscribing to the channel, or leaving me a comment uh, to tell me how ugly my hair is and how annoying my voice is. But if you if you thought I um if you thought this was worth worthless, let me know. Let me know what you thought of all this. And um, you know, all in all, I really appreciate you listening to me, putting so much time in these um 
and listening to my random thoughts for some reason, which um, you really shouldn't take too seriously. This is not a joke. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. And I wish you a great week.